So if you go to a service call or you start up a unit and the evaporator coil is at freezing or just below freezing, what are some possible causes based on the testing you do? So if you go into a call and you have an evaporator coil that's operating at freezing and you're, first of all, you have to verify what refrigerant is in that evaporator coil because you are not measuring temperature per se. Maybe you're looking at a gauge, you see a pressure and you see a saturation and you say, oh no, this thing's at freezing. Why is that? Well, make sure you know what refrigerant you're looking at. Because like I said in the previous segment, you could look at a refrigerant. If you're looking at the wrong one, one's going to be at freezing and one of them might be closer to 40 degrees. There's a big difference between R22 and R407C when you take it to that that smaller scale of R22 replacements, 407C isn't at freezing at 58 PSI. It's above freezing and enough above freezing where it could be during operating conditions that you see that 58 PSI. It might be near the bottom of the operating conditions as far as sensible temperature, but it could be attained and be in normal working order. So you have to make sure the refrigerant that you're thinking of is the correct refrigerant. And hopefully that is labeled on the unit. It's a whole nother nightmare if it's not labeled. And good luck with that. That that'd be a difficult day for anybody. So you go up and it's 32 degrees. Let's say it is R22. 32 degrees. So why is it operating at 32 degrees? First of all, what is the superheat? What is the subcooling? So let's take a first example. It's operating at 32 degrees. The superheat is zero. The subcooling is five. Maybe it's six. With a superheat of zero and a freezing coil, you can check and see if the coil is completely covered in ice because it's going to be airflow related most likely. And the reason why you can tell it's airflow related is because you don't have any heat transfer. There's no heat being absorbed by the refrigerant that's causing it to become superheated. Remember, this refrigerant is becoming superheated. It's evaporating, boiling off, however you want to think of it. And then after it boils off, it continues to warm up. Just like the air outside. It's not, it's not liquid, let's say. I hope this is going to be a good example coming here in the spur of the moment. The air is not liquid outside, but it, it's still able to heat up. When you're at that change of state between liquid and gas, it's like a flat line until you get that change of state. But once you have that change of state, you start superheating that evaporated gas or that newly evaporated gas. But to evaporate the gas in the first place, you have to be absorbing heat into the refrigerant. So if you have zero superheat, you're not absorbing heat. Airflow is low. The coil is blocked. It can be dirty. Filter can be dirty. Anything that affects airflow across the coil. The blower can be working fine, and then you could have blocked coil. You could have a blocked filter. You could have a crushed duct. You could have a whole lot of different stuff, but it all comes back to airflow. It's just different versions of airflow problems. The blower can definitely cause the problem. Blowers can go bad. ECM blowers can go haywire. We'll run at the wrong speed. Uh, you can burn up a blower, it'll run at a low speed, then go off on thermal overload, then come back on. Run capacitor on a PSC blower can be weak, causing it to run inefficiently. There's small changes that can account for these issues. And it doesn't mean you have a glaring failure. It doesn't mean the blower's not working at all. It just might be working on the wrong speed. It might be failing, but not completely failed. And there's, you can say that is completely failed, but it's not, it's not to the point where it's not working at all. So that's an airflow issue, the superheat being really, really low. Now, if the superheat was extremely high, let's say we go in there and we have a superheat of 54, and then you have a subcooling of 14, 20, a relatively high subcooling, 25. So you have a bunch of refrigerant, and what that subcooling number is telling you is that there is plenty of refrigerant in the condenser. There is so much refrigerant in the condenser that is stacking liquid back higher in the condenser than it normally would. Typically, there's a point in which the condenser turns all that superheated gas coming out of the compressor. It cools it down. It becomes liquid. It continues to cool, just like superheated gas continues to heat and warm up. The subcooled liquid continues to cool after it becomes liquid. That's why it's called subcooled liquid. So if it's continuing to cool 25 degrees, then it's probably backed up into that condenser, raising the head pressure maybe, 
causing it to cool more than it normally would, causing it to it's basically consider it like traffic. It's backed up. Now, if traffic's backed up, then there must be a reason why, and that is a restriction in the line. TXV failure, piston clogged, line crushed, service valve closed, all sorts of reasons why that can happen. Just restriction in the line, dryers, any sort of restriction, improper line sizing. If you're going to a unit for the first time, there are reasons that it can run inefficiently from the very beginning. A lot of times it won't be quite that bad because you'd probably have a If you a want to watch more videos just like on this one, unit. click on this playlist right here. But it can be a smaller here. degree of If you want to see our brand new video, click right 15. here. And you if you still want to find out more about the great sponsors that make this show happen, click up here. The and to join our email pulled, list where I notify you when we're going live, Maybe they don't right notice here. the difference. Maybe it's oversized where the lack of capacity hasn't become a big concern because they're still comfortable. Because even though the unit is inefficient, it's so oversized that even in its inefficient capacity it can still handle the load because it was oversized originally happens all the time units that run poorly can still manage a load because they're oversized they just cost a lot more and it's just a pain in the buttocks now let's say that you walk up on a unit and the sub cooling is zero or one or half of one and your superheat is high like 30 or 40 so you have no refrigerant backed up in the condenser meaning the condenser is starving for refrigerant, and you have high superheat, meaning the evaporator is also starved, meaning there's not enough refrigerant to cause that evaporator to work harder. That's kind of a weird way to say it. Work harder or take longer to change the state from a liquid gas mix going through the TXV or orifice or whatever into a fully gaseous refrigerant that it becomes superheated. So it's becoming superheated so quickly because there's not enough refrigerant to cause that process to delay to later in the evaporator. It's superheating way beyond what it should if there was a normal amount of refrigerant in that coil. So if you have starved refrigerant on one side, starved refrigerant on the other side, then you have low refrigerant. So there's a lot you can tell from the readings, the temperatures that you have. When you compare the saturation temperatures of a coil to what you have coming out, it's pretty glaring. If your saturation temperature for your R22 evaporator coil is 27 degrees, yet you have a superheat of 45, there's an issue there. It's restricted or there's not enough refrigerant in the system. A lot of times these things fall into the same categories, yet there can be different manifestations of each instance. Meaning, you could have a restriction in 20 different areas. You could have refrigerant leaks in a whole bunch of different areas, but they'll manifest in a similar way. So you got to figure that out. That's the fun of being a service tech. I mean, that's what it's all about. To me, that was the best part about it. It's figuring out what was going on. Now, I had twofold here, and we'll wrap up with this. Twofold fun things of being a service tech. One, troubleshooting, and two, the lottery of not knowing what kind of payday you were going to get. I really did enjoy this because if you found a, you know, a dead compressor, I was a uh, cell phone company, one man company. If I found a dead compressor, hey, that's good money right there. I wasn't finding dead compressors that weren't dead, mind you, but I was awful happy when I got to do some work where I earned some money. And I did enjoy that you never really knew what was going to happen. Oh, you'd probably make a, you know, you'd make some money. You'd find different things. You change run capacitors, you make money. But I always enjoyed you didn't know what you were going to get into on both the business side and the troubleshooting side. And I think my, that drove my wife crazy on the business side because you don't know what you're going to get into that day. For a guy who does mostly service, I mean, what if you don't find anything that's a high dollar earner for like a week or two weeks? But I got to tell you, in the HVAC industry, it evens out over time. If you do right by your customers... You call them like you see them. You charge them a fair amount. You're going to find plenty of everything as you grow. I never found a time when it's like, I've only done capacitors all month. I mean, it never happened. I'd always have a compressor. I'd have to change the unit because it was just so bad off or an evaporator or a condenser coil or accumulator. There was always something out there to change. And if you do it long enough, you never really have to worry about that. But, I mean, wives, they don't think about that. Sometimes wives are like, hey, what, what are we going to do? 
What are we going to do? How are we going to buy that new Land Rover? I do not have a Land Rover, by the way. I cannot afford one. <laughs> All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. I had a lot of fun talking about different things. If you want to talk about something in specific, well, that doesn't sound correct, specifically, then put it in the comments. Shoot me an email, hvacshoptalk at gmail.com. I'll be back to see you guys real soon. Stay tuned for some new videos. I have all sorts of ideas swirling in my head for stuff that will educate and entertain you guys, so stay tuned for that. If you're not subscribed, think about subscribing. If you want to help support the channel, think about becoming a channel member. You can do that by hitting the join button on the screen or hit a little dollar sign in the live chat. They said that it gives you an option for joining there. I thought it was just Super Chats, which are one-time donations to the channel, but it says you can you can do join as well. We do like a monthly support thing. So if you do that, we have several guys who do that. Thank you to those guys. I think there's 10 of you guys out there, so I really do appreciate that. Uh, my name is Zach Ciotta. This is the HVAC Shop Talk Podcast, and I will see you guys on the next one. If you want to watch more videos just like this one, click on this playlist right here. If you want to see our brand new video, click right here. If you want to find out more about the great sponsors that make this show happen, click up here. And to join our email list where I notify you when we're going live, click right here. <laughs>